Hello and welcome to another Deep Cuts Live. Um, I'm your host, Antoine Reed, and I just want to welcome you again to the show. Um, today I have a very special guest. It's somebody I met a few weeks while I was in Vegas at a trade show. Um, his name is George James. He runs Wario Cigars. Uh, we're gonna, so you're going to learn probably about maybe it's a new company to you and maybe for others you are fully aware of it. So I just want to... Uh, I guest here. George. Hello, everyone. So welcome to the, the show. Like I said, you were the first guest to kind of get our uh, intro treatment. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. How are you doing today? Uh, everything is going well. I can't complain. Awesome. So where are you from or where are you uh, kind of? Uh, where I'm from? from? Mm -hmm. I'm originally from uh, Alabama, so I got to give you guys a big road tide. So <laughs> I'm originally from Alabama. Actually, it's a small town called Moundville, Alabama, but we always say Tuscaloosa because Tuscaloosa is like 15 minutes away, you know, so uh, it's from Moundville, Alabama. Wow. So I, I feel like, you know, I don't know your story, which is great for an interview because you usually have to kind of play dumb and act like I completely don't know the answers to what most of the questions I'm answering are uh, asking. So sure. today I get to ask you questions and really learn more about you. Um, uh -huh. So I'm looking forward to kind of learning more about Boreo and how you got started. Like I said, I know we have a mutual friend in Humberto who yes. is a big fan of Boreo and what you're doing. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to discovering more about <laughs> Oreo and what right, right, we're right. so excited about you. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think the, a good place to start is for you to kind of give us an intro to you. Like, who are you? Why? How did you come to get involved in cigars? <laughs> well, first, let me start. Uh, my name is uh, George James. I'm originally from Alabama, uh, graduated from University of Alabama. And once I graduated from the University of Alabama, I started uh, with a Fortune 500 tobacco company. So uh, fast forward, I've been in the industry for about 17 years, going on 20 years. Uh, the reason why I started uh, a cigar company is that I'm from the industry. I'm from the tobacco industry. So when I gained the knowledge of uh, understanding that, hey, I like cigars myself, uh, I always wanted to own a tobacco company. Uh, and the opportunity was there for me uh, to have ownership. Being in the cigar industry so long, I don't know if people who know like that part of the industry, like I'm surprised that you would want to start a company to be honest with you, because after <laughs> you've been in here so long and you've gone through the, the hoops and the circus that is the cigar industry, yeah. at times, it kind of burns people out. So the fact that you've gone through everything that you did and all of a sudden here you are wanting to start your own company, I think says a lot, probably about your passion for the product. Right. Absolutely. And um, what I tell everyone is you, you have to have passion about it. And that's the thing that I have. You know, I have a lot of passion about the cigar industry. I'm very knowledgeable about, you know, uh, manufacturing, not only just manufacturing packaging and giving the product to the end user. And, uh, and and also marketing. Um, I'm, I'm very equipped with marketing. That was my major in college. So uh, I'm, I definitely have an understanding of marketing. And when I started my company in 2014, I started in Nashville, Tennessee. So it was just uh, an idea. Uh, and then the opportunity was there for me uh, to own my own company and, and, and manufacture my own product. Now, when you were just coming up with the concept of what you wanted to start. I mean, how did you start? Did you start from the perspective of, I want to create this this type of blend for the cigar? Or did you start from the perspective of, these are all the things that I felt are wrong with the industry. So I'm going to create a company that starts, you know, that does things right. Like well, what was the angle that you took? Well, the angle that I took is, uh, first I started with looking at the four P's. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm I'm from a marketing background, so I had to look at the price and promotion placement, and um, and I also had to look at, you know, the promotional item of the product. So when you're looking at the four P's and you're trying to gather your information, what I did was I said, well, let me look at what are their top 
four sizes. Okay, I started with the top four sizes. Then when once I gravitated from the top four sizes, I started to look at what the top four rappers were in the market. So I didn't want to oversaturate uh, people with you know so many different brands uh, with different sizes and so many different rappers. So I didn't want to have too many uh, SKUs. So I just wanted to focus a little bit more on uh, once again four sizes and four rappers. And once I grasped that concept, I decided to to have a panel of guys who uh, would sample what the, the the cigars that I blended. So I wanted them to sample those cigars. And once they sampled the cigars after trial and error, you know, you go through trial and error. Then once everything was uh, completed, then the guys were like, George, that's the green light. You need to uh, move forward with uh, manufacturing your product. So I think it, it starts with a little due diligence, uh, research in the market, and then uh, finding a panel that can assist with your blending, you know, because everyone has a different uh, palette. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't just focusing on my palette, but I'm focusing on other individual palettes as well. And we know that the cigar industry is, uh, I don't want to say oversaturated right now, but there's so many different brands for people to choose from. Sure. So when you kind of thought about just the marketing and branding for Boreo, like how, how did you approach making it feel different from anything else that's on the market today? Well, the first thing was uh, the Indonesian tobacco. Uh, from the transition from the foot to uh, the top of the cigar or the head of the cigar, I wanted to make sure that the transition was really good just in case if I had a novice smoker uh, who will graduate from you know Connecticut wrapper all the way up to uh, a Maduro wrapper. So the, the main objective is using the Indonesian tobacco to help with that transition. And, and I got that idea from uh, the cigarette industry, okay? okay? So like I said, I have a cigarette background, but it's still tobacco, but you just got to know how to blend that tobacco. Then uh, second, I think is it, it was, the most important part is just uh, having fun. Uh, finding something that's unique. Um, even with my four count packaging, I just made sure that it was more modern and uh, my my taste is more of a more upscale uh, packaging and upscale uh, blend of tobacco. So I didn't know your background was the cigarette industry. So that's a cool yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever I'm going to like a trade show or out to an event, um, usually me and the Lyft drivers always have a conversation and they think they know when I say it's a tobacco industry event, they think obviously they think cigarettes and there's such a right. difference between cigarettes and premium cigars. It is. Know? It so is. I'm sure that you, you know, like you said, you, it's probably an interesting background that you've had and that uh, insight that you've had, I will say, just for working with a product like a cigarette and then going to something like a premium cigar, because really right. two completely different products and different right. customer bases even. Well, you know, the, the leaves are different. Uh, curing the tobacco is different. Fermenting the tobacco is different. You know, it's very scientific uh, on the type of soil you use in different areas that you go to. But the concept is still the same when it comes to marketing. Uh, the concept is still the same. The only thing that's different is the way you uh, manufacture uh, the tobacco. So to backtrack a little bit what was your first experience with cigars like because obviously it was a profound experience if you're now <laughs> whole business around it well one of the executives uh, that i was working with we had a team meeting and he pulled out a cigar this was back in let me see what year was that i think it was like 2006 or something like that and he pulled out a, a Monte Cristo from a uh, Cuban uh, cigar from 1975. Wow. And he said, man, I've been curing this, you know, a couple of these cigars. He said, I, I uh, you know, been humidifying them properly. He said, I have a big humidor in my house. And he said, George, I want you to smoke one with me. And and that was my introduction. And I, I smoked it. I said, whoa, man, this, this, is, this is really nice, you know? <laughs> 
And uh, because it, the thing is, is my my family, especially my grandfather, uh, he was more into pipe tobacco. So that's a whole nother arena. Right. But uh, cigars, I just never had a cigar until that that executive gave me a cigar. And then as you worked in the tobacco industry, I guess like you kept exploring the whole world of cigars. Well, once. When it, when it came to uh, reaching our goals, accomplishing our goals as a team, uh, we would light up a cigar. It's kind of like a Super Bowl championship, uh, mm -hmm. especially when we get, you know, a competitive edge over uh, our competition. You know, if we gain market share by 15, 20 percent, we're celebrating. So uh, for a celebratory uh, item, uh, we definitely selected the cigar. And where do you see yourself gravitating towards when it comes to cigars? Like, do you look for a certain wrapper? Is there a certain taste profile? Like, what interests you? Well, uh, that's a great question. What interests me and in, in the profile I'm looking for is I like something that's real smooth, okay? Uh, has a little spice to it and has maybe uh, you can have different notes, like uh, a nutty note, or you can have... Uh, like a cocoa note, but uh, I don't like flavored cigars. Let's put that out there. I don't like any flavored cigars. I like cigars without flavor, and then I can pair it up with something like this here. So, <laughs> so when I pair it up and I have those tasting notes, that's what make the cigar uh, really good for me. You said you, you know, there's this whole thing in the cigar industry right now about you know the flavored cigars. Um, I know when I went to uh, the Dominican Republic one year, you know, cigar manufacturer was talking about how different media reviews cigars and he was saying how new the concept of reviewing was to cigar makers because cigar makers, you know, in the 90s didn't think about cigars in terms of how we describe cigars now. Like they didn't think about notes of cocoa and all the stuff. They were like, they thought it was a cigar is supposed to taste like tobacco. <laughs> so it's well, always, it, it always like gets me when, you know, I read these reviews because you get, you know, if you're new to a cigar smoking, um, you're brought into this idea that you read a review and it says notes of toasted this and, and you're like, yeah, but then you smoke it. And like, for me, like, I'm not a, a person who can pick out flavor profiles like that. So I'm like, it tastes like tobacco, but I feel like that's what it's supposed to taste like. Well, you know, you, you, you bring up a valid point. I just think that when you go to a cigar lounge and you sit down and you pair it with a good scotch, good bourbon, um, even rum at times, you, you will get those tasting notes. You will have those tasting notes once you start pairing it up. Uh, now, everyone, you know, palate, once again, is different. It's just that over once you smoke for so long, you start building that flavor and profile. And, and you know what you like and you know what you don't like. And uh, sometimes it's not nuts or, or it's not cocoa and things like that. But what, what what gets me is leather. Some guy said he tastes leather. I said, what? I said, what does leather taste like, man? I said, <laughs> I never taste leather. And then he was like, well, it has an earthy tone. I said, what is an earthy tone? Well, it tastes like uh, tastes My favorite like is barnyard. Wood. He said, what? My favorite is barnyard. Oh, God, I never heard that one. <laughs> You know, like it has a barnyard taste. I'm like, wow, <laughs> or like, you know, it has like hints of like manure, and I'm like, why? Oh, oh God, have hints that? of manure. No, <laughs> that, that be, uh, those kind of descriptors, and then you know, you have like the off the wall things. Like sometimes it's just fun for me just to listen to people describe cigars because I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It doesn't take a cigar, and I'm like. It, it doesn't taste anything like that, thank, thankfully, because right. I don't have <laughs> aroma to it or fresh sure. grass. And it makes you wonder sometimes, like, well, how are they getting these flavors? Like, what are they doing to, like, <laughs> like, how do you get a barnyard flavor profile even in your vocabulary? But Well, I think it's a lot of uh, people exaggerate. Uh, it's a lot of exaggeration. And that's the thing about the narrative is, you know, but I can't say, hey, that person might eat manure. Who knows? <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't know. So it's like I can't tell that person, hey, man, that's that's the wrong flavor and profile. But that's what they might 
have, but it will hurt the industry if that's a really good cigar and you tell someone, hey, it tastes like manure, and that person is looking at that cigar on the shelf is like, man, I don't want to eat no manure, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> is there anything like being in the industry for so long and being a cigar smoker for as long as you have been, is there anything mm -hmm. that else that kind of surprises you or like that you don't really understand? Like, why is it a thing right now? Well, a lot of people, they go inside of the uh, humidor and they start squeezing the cigars and they start sniffing the cigars. And that is very weird to me. <laughs> and, and I don't like that when I walk in a humidor and I see someone just, you know, squeezing on the cigar. And I was like, man, what are you doing? You know, you got to understand it's a wrapper, it's a binder, it's fillers, you know. So, but some, you know, it just goes back to education. I think that's what we have to do is, you know, kind of go back and and, and rewind and, and start educating people the right way. I think education is such an important part of the industry. And mm -hmm. I, always, I always kind of look at the industry almost like a Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. Marvel, you know, Marvel, the first phase was just introducing you to the characters in the universe. Right. Now they're on, you know, phase two or three sure. of this long arc. Right. <laughs> You know, maybe phase one of the cigar industry was to introduce you to cigars. And now right. the market is full of cigars. You have full exactly. characters, different personalities and stuff like that. And now it's like, what's next? I don't know if we're, I think we're kind of getting out of just that whole uh, new cigar, you know, here's a new cigar kind of thing. It's like you have to educate, um, right. be educated. So you need to understand like why people are maybe are squeezing, <laughs> squeezing cigars like Charmin. Or, you know, why they review a cigar the way they do, like why, like, I think, I think there's there's so much room for education that maybe we're not getting because we're so caught up in well, press yeah, Absolutely. I agree with you. you know, I think that, I think that with, with the education, I think it, you know, we need more CEOs uh, with their feet on the ground and out there educating uh, the actual retailers uh, and also the wholesalers as well, because the majority of the time it starts at uh, wholesale. Uh, some of these guys, they just push the product, push the product, and it just sit there on the shelf without properly educating uh, the actual retailer about, you know, where this product is grown uh, and also describing what's inside of the filler. And, and I think that goes a long way because what happens is, when that consumer walks in and and the consumer demographic is changing now, it's, it, it had already changed. It was just like a taboo, as I told previous guys, that female smokers are smoking a lot now because it, previously it was taboo for them to, to smoke in public. But now uh, you're starting to see a shift. So now with that new consumer, that new demographic that's walking inside of the humidor, I think it deserves education. And what I'm putting together uh, for my promotional plan is our QR codes that focus on the catalog. Okay. So once you walk inside of uh, uh, the humidor, I will have uh, shelf talkers. Uh, and these not the cheap shelf talkers that, that people are producing. <laughs> Everything I do is quality. So it's a quality uh, shelf talker, PVC plastic. And uh, I put a QR code on there for the consumer to scan the QR code, takes them directly to my website, and they can flip through the catalog with uh, information about the product. I think that's another good point is the use of technology, mm -hmm. to your brands, because there's so many companies that I think they get bogged down. Like what, what is technology? You know, sure. it's, it seems crazy, but it's right. like the technology is just, you know, how they sell or how they connect with the retailer to sell a product or sure. that beyond that, it's like, you know, a sales platform, maybe in social media, right? Like you have a good grasp of maybe some uh, modern day technology, like QR codes, mm -hmm. uh, websites to use that to help promote. And like I said, yeah. educate the consumer because you can't be everywhere, obviously, but no, you can't, no. A shelf talker and a QR code at, at least puts them, you know, in touch with your brand and sure. to think, or get them the information that they might need to make some informed decisions as they're trying to choose your brand over the one sitting next to it in the humidor. 
Absolutely. And then it gives it opportunity for that individual to become a brand ambassador. See, when we think of brand ambassadors or what's the new name that they call them now uh, in the c- cigar industry, I can't think of the name. Um, uh, uh, geez, I can't think of the name right now. But anyway, they become brand ambassadors. And 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 and, and me, I focus on touch points. When, when you know, in the, in the t- cigarette industry, we always had touch points. Touch points, one touch point was at the, uh, uh, where they pump gas, that was a touch point. At the door was a touch point. Behind the back bar where the cigarettes are displayed, that was a touch point. And uh, when the consumer has it in their hands, that's a touch point. So what I try to do is focus on touch points and try to build brand ambassadors who eventually uh, educate not only their friends, but also educate a stranger as well. And I think that's also important. Like you seem to be picking up, like I said, you have like a better marketing plan on how to kind of build up Boreo throughout. Right. Because I, it always, like I said, something about the cigar industry that always surprises me is how localized the marketing efforts are. Yes, yes. The idea that um, we're going to send out brand reps and they're going to have these little events everywhere around the U.S. or something like that. And it's like, that's great. But what happens for people who are not in that lo- local area or what exactly. happens who can't make it out to this big expensive event, like not everybody can afford to go to Big Smoke or right. can afford to exhibit at a trade show or attend a trade show. Sure, it's like you have to think outside. I think of traditional marketing uh, to get more eyeballs on brands and to get more people smoking a product. Well, you know, I think what adds value long term, and this is just my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of you know, brick and mortar is still primary. Uh, e-commerce is primary, but we have these uh, new innovative uh, mobile uh, tobacco uh, vehicles that's out there now that's going from uh, city to city, state to state. And I think that's a unique way of advertising, getting your brand out there. And, and then you never go wrong with uh, digital marketing, such as you know marketing with you guys uh, digitally and also marketing in uh, print ad as well. Print ad to me is still valuable. Uh, some people say, oh man, it's, it's, it's the dinosaur. I'm like, no, it's still valuable because me, I still like to read books. I like to flip through the pages. I'm, I'm, I'm crazy like that people. I like to flip through the pages, but I also like to um, um, look at my cell phone too, because I travel a lot. So I, I like to look at my cell phone and, and look at digital ads that way as well. Well, I think that's good to mention because, you know, we live in this media world and uh, we always have traditional print media, printed paper and stuff like that is old school, but it may be old school to a newer generation. But at the same time, it's good to use if you want to connect with, uh, you know, people who do like to read books or people sure. who, who like me, like I like to read, but right. I can read an ebook. <laughs> like I've tried it. <laughs> holding a book and be able to flip through the pages and I like to highlight and fold right. the page. I have to do, interact with it. But I think, right. you know, it has its, its purpose. But like you said, I also like uh, digital stuff. I like to be able to go on to Instagram every morning and see, sure. you know, through, go on TikTok now, get information. Um, so right. you kind of have to put yourself out there in front of where everybody uh, is. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what's transforming the market. And I think that long-term, you know, I've always been ahead of technology when it comes to my company, because at one point my company was a hundred percent online and did very well. Then COVID, you know, uh, well, I started transitioning into uh, brick and mortar, but I was in brick and mortar prior to COVID uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, but I'm very selective at where I want to go because I know technology is going to uh, transform brick and mortar uh, sooner or later because you see COVID, uh, it definitely affected a lot of the brick and mortar because uh, the feedback that I received uh, from a lot of my customers is that, hey, man, we had to get creative. And sometimes they had to create an online uh, portal for the consumers to access. And I definitely think, like you said, I think COVID changed. I know looking at the data and the uh, financial reports that have come in that a lot of these companies had really big 
years during COVID, uh, right. digital, and then right. the break was kind of, I don't want to say they were suffering, but it was different because they were, you know, relying on people coming into their store. And so they started embracing some digital um, tools, I guess you could say, or resources. Right. But they kind of, I think they're in a weird position where they're kind of figuring out how do I still, you know, how do I keep up the digital stuff? How do I go back to pre-COVID stuff or just getting people to come in the store? It seems like we're in this weird kind of gray area now of trying to figure out right. what is the best method to uh, get more eyeballs and, like I said, get more customers in the stores. Well, I, I think that a lot of people just have to embrace change. You know, one thing about the tobacco industry, we don't like change. I'm about to say, <laughs> George, like, it's very hard to get people to change, like, once they get into their uh, rut and uh, right. their and, you know, when I come in with QR codes, they're looking at me like, George, are you George Jefferson or something? You know what's going on, man? We not, we're not trying to do all that. But I tell them, I said, man, this is the way for you. Can, you can focus more on services and let me focus more on the education because you need to provide good service. That's one way to keep your doors open, you know, and, and make sure that you're looking at your, uh, your gross margin. Right. And it's funny because I think, you know, we've had some comments come in in the last few minutes. And I'll just show some of the comments. But uh, here's our friend Humberto. <laughs> ah, Humberto. <laughs> so, so Humberto works at Cigar Package Design. For those of you who don't know, definitely check them out. But uh, let me was, say something about Humberto. Uh, Humberto helped me design all four of my uh, cigar rings. OK, he helped me design those and he was a big help with everything, even the duck and son, the hat I have, Humberto helped me design that. So my, anytime I had a vision, I'll call Humberto. Hey, Humberto, I got this vision, man. He's like, okay, George, slow down. Let me, let me. <laughs> well, Humberto, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. And we also had a, another viewer. Um, so they, first, they smoked their first Boreal cigar in Kemet. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's Pianchi. Hey, Pianchi, what's going on, brother? <laughs> I went to uh, Egypt, Kemet. Uh, with uh, Pianchi, that's 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 my brother right there. Okay, wow. See, so you, you, yeah, you, you're a global brand, which I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking about Egypt, guys, guess what? I got this. This ashtray is Barrio Cigars ashtray. is made out of alabaster stone. You can purchase it online. Okay, you need high quality. This thing is super heavy, so you can get it online. Barrio is gonna advertise like crazy. <laughs> Somebody else says, "Wow." A global brand. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wife. I love you, baby. <laughs> awesome. I love when we get actually get comments because it makes it a little bit more interesting to see what <laughs> and, uh, to interact with it. It kind mm -hmm. of brings a new uh, atmosphere into it. So now, like, let's talk about your products. So okay. maybe okay. So I have a video. Let me. Uh -huh set up and while i get that set up i'll tell people so like i said a couple weeks ago we were both at a trade show um if you've been on deep cuts uh instagram i kind of played this video already but um uh, let me see Mario cigars i'm the owner welcome to my booth 2006 here in las vegas nevada the unique thing I want to talk about today is that I started my company in 2014 in Nashville, Tennessee, and I created a distribution center in Frisco, Texas. All my cigars are Dominican uh, blended uh, tobacco, and I want to introduce you guys to uh, some of my cigars. I have four different wrappers, and I have four different sizes, starting with the John Canoe. <clears throat> the John Canoe is unique because it has my face on it, okay? I tell everyone that John Canoe means unknown, and you have a Connecticut, and you have uh, uh, is a Connecticut and Habano wrapper combined together to make a barber stripe, uh, make a barber pole. Here you have the uh, Habano wrapper. Here is the Duck in the Sun. Duck in the Sun means the sons of God. So it's definitely a unique Habano blend, guys. You would definitely love this. Okay, uh, both are medium body. Then down here you will have the Toro six by fifty. This is a variety pack, so you get. Uh, a different variety of what I have to offer. Over here, if you guys walk over here with me, 
let me explain. This is the first king gold, and this is the first king platinum. Guys, keep in mind that when I created the Maduro wrapper, I was keeping Cuba in mind. A lot of uh, the way they blend their cigars and the way uh, they fire cure their cigars, they make it super dark. So I was just trying to bring that tradition back. And we, and this is more of a full body. And this here, you will see that um, this is a Connecticut wrapper. A lot of people say it's very creamy, very smooth. Great introduction to uh, novice uh, smokers. Guys, the unique thing about um, this box is that it has a Bible scripture on it. First Kings 6 chapter 29 verse. Guys, please visit um, me on Instagram, Vario, V as in Victor, O-R-I-E-O. -E please follow me on Instagram. You can also go to my website at www.vario, V as in Victor, O-R-I-E-O.com. Look forward to seeing you. My God. <laughs> 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 intro to yeah. your company in there and uh, I don't think we can stop there of course but uh, there's a lot to unpack from that video uh, sure. I wanted people to see that video because you have one of the nicest booths because usually people who have you know the smaller booths they don't always know how to design it right. and how to make it visually impactful but you were like kind of on a corner and you really had those colors popping and like I said the designs definitely okay out from from everyone else so i wanted people to be able to kind of i know that they all couldn't be in vegas with us but yeah. uh, i want them to be able to see um you know what that looked like so um you were saying that your products are all made in the dominican republic is that right yes, yes. manufacturing men in dominican republic yes so why did you choose the dominican republic over other countries um the reason why i chose dominican republic because uh there were opportunity uh, to buy the factory. So, uh, that's the thing. I own the factory. Uh, second was, uh, when you're looking at, uh, the Dominican Republic blend is to me similar to Cuba is, is, you know, you have all the rollers from Cuba who moved to the Dominican. And to me, the soil is about the same when it comes to the pH of the soil. So I didn't know you own your own factory, but that's always, I think that's always, that gives people a big advantage that I don't think they realize. Like when you're a retailer, you hear right. advice that retailers give other retailers is own your building. Sure. And you're kind of doing that on the manufacturing side. You're owning, you know, who makes, who and how your cigars get made, which is super important, especially sure. a big lesson. I think a lot of people learned over the last two years is that if you don't control that process, <laughs> you're kind All of right. set up for um, not a lot of trouble, but some troubles because you're oh, a lot yeah. of of others. Well, that differentiates me from everyone else. You know, I don't go to Florida and buy uh, bundles of product and throw, you know, print stuff from Staples and just throw a label on it. You know, it's like I said, it's passion. I go for passion. Cigar rings, uh, manufacture all my rings. Okay. So shout out to cigar rings in the Dominican Republic. Uh, they manufacture all the top premium companies rings that are out there. Cigar rings. Some people here say cigar bands in the Dominican. We say cigar rings. Okay. So all my cigar rings is uh, made by them. Uh, secondly, uh, I just take quality in my product. Uh, when it comes to the box, you know, my box is unique because it's all cedar. Okay. Some people don't use cedar anymore. Uh, they kind of shortcut the lid will not be cedar, and then uh, the base of it will be cedar. I do all cedar. So when you smoke, when you uh, open my box, so if you purchase one of these four count boxes here, okay, um, this is a Toro size box here. And once you open it, you smell, my God, this, the freshness of it. Okay, so you would smell that cedar. So that's that's the thing that differentiates me. Also, uh, the metal that I use. Uh, it's all custom to open and close my boxes. Uh, so that's another thing that's unique. And then this oval shaped, more modern box for anyone that wants to travel and have a, a good premium uh, four count of Vario cigars, uh, people are willing to get that. Uh, also, a unique thing about me is that I did the 10 count box versus 20 count. In the beginning, I did 20 count, but I noticed that uh, it just took a lot for a 20 count to move. I think that you need to have a stronger brand equity for 20 count. 
So I focus on 10 count and it moves off the shelf fast. And the reason why is because I'm constantly building that equity. Now, once my company become, you know, 15, 20 years uh, in the industry, then I can really start focusing on, you know, 20 count and 25 count. Can you talk a little bit more about brand equity? Because again, I think it takes somebody who's been in the industry as long as you have to kind of use that term and know what that means. But I think for some people who may be watching this, brand equity might be a new term or concept to them. So just kind of describe what brand equity is and how companies can go about building that up. Well, you know, that's that's a great question. I think brand equity, it starts with creativity. It starts with a vision. Some people copy other people because uh, that's the trend. And, and I tell everyone, don't follow the trend. Be creative. Do something that's creative and also do something that can build brand equity. Okay. For example, the duck in the sun, this is brand equity. Uh, I also own the intellectual property on all my stuff. So if you use it and, and it's not approved, you can get sued by, by me and then I, I will have my attorneys uh, sue you as well. So here's the thing with the brand equity is so, for example, you travel to uh, Egypt, you will see this all over the place in the temples. So it's, it's a refresher of the memory. So I was always taught you got to leave a footprint in the mind of uh, the consumer, okay? And you have to leave a positive footprint. And that's where the brand equity comes. You know, it comes into leading up to positive footprint. Like, for example, Vario means king of the sun, okay? Uh, most tobacco is grown in the sun, you know? <laughs> so it goes right along with the concept. Then when you're looking at the John Canoe, uh, that's my face on there uh, with the feather. And, and uh, it's just a celebration of uh, being, you know, African-American people. That, that goes right along um, with the celebration. But it's made for everyone is what I, I tell everyone. And then, like I said, you got the duck and son, which is a Habano rapper. And then you have the first king. Um, six chapter 29 verse, which is uh, a Bible scripture on the platinum and the gold. So, you know, I, I, I read the Bible. I, uh, you know, I grew up reading the Bible and things like that. So that was a dedication to uh, my mother. And also, you know, the duck and sons is a dedication to me becoming aware of uh, there's other creative things that are out there. So what I tried to do with my product, I tried to tell a story. That's another thing with brand equity is you gotta have a story, uh, a, a unique story. And some people will like your story and some people will not like your story, but you know, the story is not for everyone. So, but if you do like the story, I, I really want you to support the product. But to me, that's what the, that's what's established the foundation of brand equity. When you talk about stories, I always, obviously, you know, most of my day is spent writing stories about people, but mm -hmm. surprised me in the cigar industry right now, how I think we're forgetting the story um, of a lot of these brands. Like, I don't know the story of some of these brands. And right. I, think, I think the longer they've been in the industry, they don't need to tell that story anymore. And a press release sometimes does not tell a story. It sure. just it's out wrapper binder filler. Here's the MSRP, buy it. And then I feel exactly. like, and I feel exactly. like watch how the, the art goes. It's like the press release comes out, you get an hour of good press. Right. And then plateaus after that. And I don't right. know what happens beyond that. Maybe they continue to sell it. I don't know. But uh, it just seems like it fizzles. But maybe it's yeah. like a lot of these brands, uh, maybe they don't, I don't know, if they're not aware that they're not telling their story, or maybe they don't want to tell the story right now for some reason. Like, do you think the industry needs to kind of get back to that, figuring out, like you said, the brand equity and figuring out what their story is and communicate that a little bit more? Well, I think, I think, you know, uh, the brand equity and them communicating their stories, you're absolutely right. I think they need to get out there and start communicating that story. Uh, so the consumers uh, will be educated, not just the consumers, but also the retailers, because how can a retailer convey that message to a consumer when there's no story? So for example, like this, this is actually a book. I tell people this is the reason why I made this. I designed this in an oval shape because this is actually a book. When you open it up, it's telling the it's telling the story, okay? And it has boba the packs in there, so there you go, guys. But that's what it's about. It's about the creativity because I'm an artist. Now, if you gave me a pen 
and you gave me some paper and said, George, draw it, draw a picture. I can't draw it because I'm I'm not that artist. I'm a visual artist. OK, but I love art. Uh, I collect art. You know, it's art all over my home. When you if you ever visit my home is art everywhere. So I love art. And and I tell people that's what creates the story is having that foundation of uh, where you're sourcing that information and bringing that information to, together and where when a consumer see that information, he or she will will definitely indulge a little bit more and then they will enjoy the cigar more because I think at the end of the day, guys, it's an experience. And that's what I think the industry is right now, too, is like mm -hmm. that, kind of moving away from the, the idea of release a new product that's that's you know you've done your job right for start creating experiences in different ways i mean this is part of the reason why i do you know this kind of talk show format sure create an online experience for people who want to learn a little bit more about companies but right you know the experience part of the industry is important because um depending on where you live and what the smoking laws are there and what your situation is, you might not have an, a lot of uh, opportunity to smoke with people, or you might not have the opportunity to meet a brand owner like this. Right, uh, people are getting are being able to listen to you right now. Yeah, absolutely. Experience is uh, you hit the nail on the head about you know the importance of focusing on that experience and building that experience for people. And 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 just to go back to what you were saying about the booth. At TPE, everyone think they have they need a huge booth. And I'm not talking against buying a huge booth, but if you have the brand equity and you also had a funding, go for it. But you could take something small and make it into an, a, a giant or, or a huge billboard. That's what I was thinking. You know, hey, how can I take this small area and turn it into a billboard? Eventually, one day you guys will see Vario Cigars taking up majority of the space, you know. But my focus right now is making sure that you guys have a really good experience, making sure that the product is, uh, you know, produced well and and making sure that my my tobacco is aged over five years. So that's another thing, you know, making sure that I don't have a product that's under uh, five years. Talk about that a little bit, the idea of scaling your business, because that's always one of my favorite business topics. Mm -hmm. Many people start a business and they set the, the lofty goals of I'm going to make a million dollars or I'm going to, uh, you know, have this many followers or whatever. And it's always these lofty goals, but right. that's scaling You're like scaling right. to me. It's actually having a plan and saying, this is how I'm going to grow this, this business. And it means sometimes maybe, you know, saying no to certain opportunities because it's not, doesn't fit with the, plans or where you're at right now. So how are you approaching scaling Boreo? Well, I, I started, that's a great question on um, how I started scaling. I think I started first, I didn't focus more on hats and accessories. I think a lot of people, they focus too much on hats and accessories. And that's where they're spending majority of their, uh, in, well, majority of their budget. So I think that you need to focus on purchasing premium product and uh, upgrading your boxes. Excuse me. Was my boxes always, you know, like upgraded the way they are now? No, it, it was a process for me working and getting an understanding of, you know, how cedar keeps the the the, the humidity inside of the uh, inside of the boxes. So it's either you can go with cedar or you can go with stuff that's not cedar. So these are things I had to make a decision on. Or should I go purchase a bunch of hats or upgrade my boxes? You see what I'm saying? Now, some people in the industry say, let me just get the hats and then I can, you know, kind of swindle my way into the industry. But when you meet a connoisseur, they're going to be like, nah, man, this is not this is not quality. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I think when I'm scaling, I'm just looking at adding a little piece at a time. Okay. I started with my, uh, so I started looking at the, the quantity size first 10 count versus 20 count. And a lot of retailers will tell you, Hey, I need this and I need that. But I sit down and, and, and talk to them about their business. That's another part of scaling. It, it's not always about 
what George wanted. Of course, I would love to have a hundred boxes or a thousand boxes, you know, uh, you know, maybe 20 on the shelf and uh, back stock. I would love to have that. But sometimes that's not economical for uh, the retailers. So we try to scale and look at where their business is going, where, you know, how many uh, facings I need in their in their humidor because sometimes they they're oversaturated with stuff that's not selling so i scale that and then i go back to my company and say well uh, maybe i can put some ashtrays in there uh some really good premium ashtrays alabaster ashtrays inside of their uh, vip or maybe out there in the lobby area and that will build brand equity within itself because people are going to see barrio cigars inside the ashtray okay so now that's a touch point. Remember, I was talking about touch points earlier. Then you go inside of the humidor, you see Vario Cigars. That's another touch point. Now you're going to the catalog. That's the third touch point. So all of this is scaling to make sure that I'm budgeting correctly and making sure that I'm adding value long term. Because the, the main thing we want to hear is ching ching, you know, and I think that adds value to <laughs> long term. But scaling, I just tell everyone, start small. And then work your way up because this industry is, is is not for the weak. And what's something that you've learned over the years of being a brand owner that you wish you had known when you first started doing Vorio? Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me take a sip on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Majority of the stuff I knew when it came to pricing, I think pricing is hard for a lot of people. Uh, all my retailers have 50% gross margin. So, I just throw that out there. Uh, on average, uh, Keystone is about 35, 40%. So what I tell everyone is that I think the hardest part for me was logistics. You know, uh, logistics is uh, definitely tough uh, when you're importing and exporting uh, when it comes to the FDA, making sure that you're following their regulations and, and keeping things you know, according to their uh, to their uh, uh, platform and making sure that you're compliant with what they're asking. But um, at the end of the day, I think that's the hardest part was the logistics. What have you learned about yourself since you started, since you've become a brand owner? I think that um, as a brand owner, I think I've learned more about uh, listening making sure that my ears are open to what the retailers are saying and also the consumers. Um, I think my, my listening skills has increased and I learned to talk slow, <laughs> not talk so fast, talk slow because I want to articulate uh, the educational material and I want to articulate uh, things to the retailers. So I learned to talk slow and uh, listen more. Now, there are going to be some people who watch this or listen to this in playback mode, and they're going to say, I can start my own brand. I want to start my own brand. I have my own idea. It's going to be cool. It's going to be this or that. What's your advice to some of those people who still maybe want to, not, maybe it's not even cigars, but maybe it's their own business idea. How do they get started? Where should they get started before they kind of jump all in? Well, my first thing is... Uh how for them to get started, I always tell them first thing first is own your intellectual property. That's the first thing. Uh, trademark your stuff. Uh, own everything. You know, I own everything 100%. So I don't have any investors, no angel investors, no private investors. I own everything. Okay. I think that's the key part to becoming an entrepreneur is the intellectual property. Because what some people do, they start the corporation, the LLC first. And then they go back and try to start, you know, getting the social media and things like that in place. Then someone else already has it. But if you own that intellectual property and you have some good attorneys, you can always, you know, uh, dispute that in court. I think that's the number one thing is intellectual property. And then second thing is, uh, you know, just have fun. Be creative. Don't copy anyone. Uh, don't look at other people's product. Just be creative. I think that's what adds value long term is being creative and creating a story. You now it's funny because we still we had another comment come in as we were talking. You know, 
my first cigar was Vorio. Again. <laughs> All my people that went to Egypt with me. <laughs> On the map. Uh, how does it feel to have created this company? And like you have these people, like I said, who are smoking your product, who are kind of supporting it like that. How does that feel as a as a business owner? Wow, that's a great question. Um, it feels great. I, I was telling my wife I was in a grocery store walking one day. I was just casually walking, purchasing groceries, and I saw a guy with a hat like this on. And I was like, "Oh my god, he, that's a Mario <laughs> hat!" You know, so it's it's still shocking. And and at the end of the day, I I just have fun with it. You know, I want everybody to have the product. I want the product in everyone's hands. And and I stress that everyone get out there and purchase the product. And and like I said, it's 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 a happy moment when you see that. <laughs> it's a happy moment. What was your as a as Oprah likes to call it? What was your aha moment with your business? Like when you kind of said, "This is working. Like I'm on the right path." Like, did you have a moment like that yet, or is are you still waiting for the aha moment? Well, the aha moment is uh, at TPE last year. Uh, 2021. Uh, so many people were coming to the booth, and I didn't anticipate that. And then uh, uh, Ed Reed showed up to the booth, and I talked to him, and I, you know, I wasn't expecting that. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, just people just out there uh, showing love and 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 posting the product. I, I really appreciate that, and that's what I like like to see. Where do you hope to take your brand in the future? Like I know you said you're. The whole interview you've talked about, you know, in the future, bigger presence, bigger this or that. Like, where do you kind of see Vorio going and how long do you think it's going to take really to uh, to get to that point? Uh, it's not going to take that long. I'm already almost there. OK, I think a couple years uh, I'm going to try to uh, purchase other companies uh, to merge with uh, Vario Cigars. And uh, that's my objective is purchase other companies. And also my 10 year anniversary is uh, 2024. And I, I have a spectacular box that I'm bringing out. It's, it's going to be a limited box, but I, the creativity that I'm about to do on that box, you guys are going to be like, whoa. And, uh, and also I think that uh, another thing is making sure Vario has an app. I'm, I'm trying to create an app, but I want to make sure that I'm, within the uh, guidelines of the FDA. So, right. you know, and making sure that that app can be uh, accessible to anyone that's over 21. So. See, I think you're just so, like I said, forward thinking, like yeah. <laughs> in the cigar industry, somebody talk about apps, somebody talk about the use of social media, but the balance with traditional media and stuff like right. that. It's very hard to, to find that uh, these days because you f find a lot of people just one track so it seems like you really have like a, a big vision which is nice and i think that's going to take you far in this industry thank you i really appreciate that you know um you know as we kind of roll down to the last couple minutes of our interview i just wanted to, uh -huh. to talk about the importance of a uh, representation because mm -hmm. you know I, i've had a lot of people of color on deep cuts uh in the last two years or so. And, um, you know, this topic of, of, you know, there's more pe diversity finally coming out in the industry. Now you've been in the industry a while. So Ooh, I, yeah. <laughs> how do you think that the issue of diversity has changed? Has, has it in your experience, has it gotten better? Is it, has it always been there? Has it just not been prevalent and, uh, seen like, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, you know, been in the industry for so long. Uh, this industry, if you look at the origin of the industry, it was already established by, you know, uh, black people. A at the end of the day, you know, I just say it like that. But far as from a, a monetary perspective, it was established by, you know, white people. So. Uh, the industry, when I started, it was very slim when it comes to having more representation, especially on the executive level of uh, African-Americans. OK, 
but I've noticed that there's been a transition that now you're starting to see more African Americans who were uh, smokers in the past who are becoming owners of uh, cigar lounges, also becoming owners of uh, cigar companies, uh, which is a good thing. And I think that adds value, that adds a lot of diversity to the industry. Not only does it add a lot of diversity, it also gives people uh, a different narrative, okay? Um, in the past, you know, the narrative was always controlled by certain people, but now you're starting to see a different narrative and you're starting to see more people open up and when I walk in the cigar lounge, I, I love to see diversity because I, I, I tell everyone, you know, my, my cigars, I created it from a black man's mentality, from a black man's perspective, but I didn't just create it for my people. I created it for everyone. I want everyone to purchase the product. But uh, sometimes at, at certain points, you know, some people don't purchase the product, but you know, I, I, I don't get mad. I don't, you know, I have tough skin. I've been in the industry a long time. So it's always a way to try to find out how can I maybe create a SWOT analysis on this person and find out what the uh, the the threats are, what the opportunities are for me to bring that product in. And then sometimes you just can't do business with people. But I think that on the African American perspective, since this is Black History Month, I think that uh, a lot of our people are you know gravitating towards uh, tobacco industry. The numbers have always been there. So I tell people numbers have always been there. It's just that uh, we we just didn't have the capital at the time to move forward with investing. Well, like I said, I think, uh, you know, this discussion is the same one that you kind of see happening in the uh, NFL, I believe, right. with I, the idea of brand owners and team owners and stuff like that. But I think we are starting to see a little bit more representation and people like you are coming mm -hmm. forth and people who like yourself again, who are showing the professionality, right. um, you know what they're doing. Cause I think, you know, for some reason, sometimes we get a bad rep of the idea that, you know, we're not as uh, prevalent in the industry cause maybe we don't know as much as, you know, the next person next to us, but obviously like Boreo, uh, kind of shows that that's not the case. <laughs> no, no, it's not the case. And, and, we know how to produce our premium product. Look at Virgil, you know, how he took over uh, an RIP to him and how he transformed uh, Louis Vuitton. And I tell everyone, you know, we, we're here, you know, African-Americans, we know how to create stuff and we know how to make things, uh, you know, good premium product and we know how to source product. So uh, don't count us out. <laughs> that's, that's what I always tell everyone. And, uh, and like I said, I'm open to do business with anyone, but, it has to make sense. You have to have the right vibe with me because I interview everyone before I put them, put my product in their stores. I sit down and I talk with them to make sure that they're educated about the brand because if they are lackadaisical and not educated about it, what happens is uh, that product will suffer uh, on the shelf. And, and once again, just because you're a black owned business doesn't mean that you're producing good quality product, you know, because, you know, if, if you're going to get into this industry, make sure you're producing quality. Now, on the, the last note of quality, people obviously are going to want to try your products after you've uh, they learn all about it. Like I said, you make your own, you make the products, you own the factory. Uh, it's quality tobacco. How can people, besides the information that's on the screen now, what website do they need to go to? What Instagram they need to follow? How can they um, find your product um, mm -hmm. in the product? Well, one, uh, how you can find the product is I have a, if you're looking for brick and mortar, I have a, a retail locator or store locator on my website. You can uh, type in the zip code and it can tell you exactly where you can purchase or uh, where you can purchase uh, brick and mortar. Uh, second, if you want to purchase online, let's say if it's international, uh, individual that would like to purchase, such as Canada, uh, even in uh, Africa, Dominican, and, and Europe. Guys, you can get online and purchase at www.vario.com. I always tell everyone, brick and mortar, um, if you go inside a brick and mortar, it's always going to be less. But if you purchase on my website, it's going to be just a little bit more. Um, and uh, you will have shipping 
uh, ship via UPS and you have to be over 21. So adult uh, signature over 21 has to sign for it if you purchase online, but it's available. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Like I said, I've learned a lot about Rio and about you. And I think uh, the people who watched and who will watch this in playback mode sure. um, also learn a lot about what makes your brand so special. And I hope that they do, like I said, follow up uh, on your website and Instagram and follow you and yes. uh, smoke the product because actually, you know, smoking the product is uh, the main goal here. So you can yes. kind of see what we're talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank everyone for watching today. Um, for more interviews like this, you can go to deepcutslive.com. We do at least one show a week, hopefully, <laughs> if things. <laughs> um, so we have another show coming up Thursday uh, with uh, Rainer from HVC Cigars. So that will be uh, something that you all could take part in. And um, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you hit that like button, the follow button. And the same thing for YouTube. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell notification to be notified anytime that we post new content or go live with interviews like this. So I wanna thank George again for joining me again for this great hour of conversation. Absolutely. And thank you all for watching. And hopefully you will join me, like I said, again, later on this week for another episode of Deep Cuts. Absolutely, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.